Hello and welcome to another great interview episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. We are here with Karen Eman from Proverbs 31 Ministries. Karen is a Proverbs 31 Ministries speaker and a New York Times bestselling author. She writes for Encouragement for Today Online Devotions that bring God's peace, perspective, and purpose to over 4 million women daily. Karen is the author of 11 books, including the book we're going to discuss today, Keep Showing Up, which is about marriage and just the message that that Karen is here to talk about today is so relevant. And we are just so excited to talk with her today about building strong marriages through prayer and and specifically to talk about her book. Um, Karen is also the speaker track director of Proverbs 31. She speaks conference. She's a teaching staff member of their writer's training site, Compel. And Karen, thank you so much for being with us today. We're really excited to talk with you. Thanks so much for having me. So we like to begin some of our interviews with a just for fun question. So I wanted to ask you about, since we're talking about marriage, what is the funniest thing that you and your husband have ever argued about? <laughs> well, let me think. It's, it's kind of funny that you should ask that. We just moved into a new house recently. And as we speak, my husband is out in the laundry room painting and I'm in my walk-in closet recording this podcast and him painting makes me think of something we argued about once when we owned our very first house there was this mailbox that was attached to the front of our tiny little brick house but the paint was flaking and he needed to repaint it or somebody needed to repaint it he drew the short straw so he got to repaint it <laughs> and he and he bought this little can of I think Rust-Oleum black paint and he was going to repaint this mailbox and he was sitting <laughs> the little jar or the little can of paint on the sidewalk and I said are you sure you want to do that because that could knock over and of course you know he probably thought I was mothering him and he's like no it's fine I'm not going to knock a can of paint over and I said well you know my dad always would put a can of paint if it was small like that inside a bucket and then that way if it knocks it knocks in the bucket and it's not going to ruin the sidewalk well you can probably imagine what happened. <laughs> he was extremely careful, but he knocked it over and it was oil-based paint. Uh -huh. So he could not get it out of that newly poured cement sidewalk. And it's, that was like 30 years ago and it's probably still there to this day. Oh my every, goodness. every once in a while when, when we're painting, we look at each other and I'm like, are you going to put drop cloth down? Or, <laughs> Cause he just, he is an excellent painter and he's a very detailed guy and he rarely like, he'll just paint without taping anything or putting a drop cloth down or putting a bucket under a small can of paint. So whenever we argue about that or other things where you need to be careful, I'll always say, remember the mailbox? And we still kind of bring it up today. Well, I, and I think that's really interesting that you bring up that you mentioned that what your dad did, because in your book, you kind of talk about that, like about what our parents do and what we have, the expectations that we have coming into marriage. And so could you just give us a little kind of brief overview of the premise behind your book, Keep Showing Up, and what inspired you to write it? Well, I wrote the book in part for myself because my marriage has not been a walk in the park. I, this is not a marriage book written by somebody who just feels like they're an expert on marriage and has all this advice to give because it's come so easily to them. My husband and I actually have had a really hard time being married for three decades. In fact, when we were in our premarital counseling, sitting with the pastor, we had just finished a whole battery of personality profile tests that got really detailed into your personality type and how you process life and how you think and all of this stuff, how you react under stress, blah, blah, blah. And I remember the pastor looking at us and saying, uh, I really don't want to tell you this, but I've got to be honest, that two people who have your exact two profiles who get married have probably about a 5% or less chance of staying married. And I remember kind of being discouraged by that, but then I'm also one of these people where if you tell me I, something can't be done, I'm like, oh, yes, it can. Watch me, you know? Um, yeah. so, so I wrote it for me just to sometimes even preach little sermons to myself to tell myself to keep showing up because marriage isn't always a walk in the park for me. Um, and then also I wrote it because I had a, actually one friend who was going through a hard time in her marriage and she suggested that I write it. She said, you know, I think that you and Todd have 
done the hard work, have learned a lot of lessons, have learned some strategies that's helped things get better over the years. And I think you could share that with other people and with just people breaking up so rampant in our culture. And I'm not talking about legitimate biblical reasons or situations of abuse, none of that. So don't mishear me. But just people who think, man, I'm not really happy anymore. I think I'll start over with someone else. You know, it's just so rampant that I thought, you know, if Todd and I could make it with the odds stacked against us and still be married 30 years later and actually be happy, we have a lot of fun in our marriage. There's a lot of things I absolutely love about it. But if it's, if you were to ask me if it's easy, it's not easy. So I wanted to write it for other women for whom marriage isn't easy, but it can be good and it can be something that points other people to God because there's no other reason that you're still married other than divine intervention because you're just not naturally wired to get along with your certain personalities that you have. I love that. And I really, I think such an, one of the really important messages that I came away with after reading your book was that sometimes we go into marriage and we have this expectation that if it's not easy, that something's wrong with us and it's not going to be easy. And even for people that might not have that, you know, 5% statistic standing against them, it's still not easy. And, and so I just really love this whole idea of backing up and, and looking at marriage from the inside of you rather than pointing fingers at your husband. It's looking at, at yourself and beginning there. And that just, it, so much of what you said really resonated with me, including actually just now when you were talking about the marriage personality tests, my husband and I, I think we were already married and we went to this marriage conference and we had a similar thing happen where we took these personality tests and they assigned an animal to your personality. Yes. I yes. was a golden retriever and he was a lion. And they said from the stage, these two person, you know, if you're a, a golden retriever and a lion matched up, it's not a great match. And it's the same kind of thing where, you know, there are things that are hard because we are so different. And, um, but I, I, I love this book. So let's just jump right in. Um, the, I would say my very favorite chapter that was the most relevant to this podcast being a prayer podcast was a little farther down on the list and it was the setup for success and in that chapter you say that the hard realities of marriage should drive us to God's word and that God's word often encourages us to communicate with God in prayer but not in a sa saintly and safe way reciting eloquent words and pious platitudes but by falling on our faces in desperation begging for help and that was I love that because it really is at the heart of the way, I guess the prayers that I picture being the prayers that are, are just the most, I don't know, sincere and the ones that God just has to, they, they just have to get straight through to God if there is a hierarchy of prayers. So, um, so in that, in that prayer life that surrounding our marriage, you outline these two really practical and helpful ways to do that kind of prayer. And like one of them was giving thanks for the things that are unique to your husband or the positive things, and then reframing the negative. So can you talk about those two elements as they pertain to, to your prayer life in your marriage? Yes. So I think that, um, I don't know, we, we look at our marriages and we have this selective uh, thing that goes on where we just, it's like we're looking at all of the times with our husband and we've got a highlighter in our hand and we're only highlighting that which is bad. We, it comes to the surface. We're upset about it. We want to fix it. We want to change him. And sometimes we get so frustrated with what's wrong. Um, and, and by wrong, sometimes I don't really mean wrong. I just mean different. Like our spouse does something different, <laughs> different than we would do it differently. And we interpret that as wrong and we want to fix it and it gets us frustrated. And we just highlight all of the the kind of down times, the valley times, and we forget about the good times. We especially forget about the times early on, what first attracted us to our spouse, what things we loved about him, sometimes in the mundaneness of life and the everything that needs to get done, the shuffling of kids if you have them and taking out the trash and all of that, all of that good and that fun 
kind of just goes to the back burner and we just highlight the negative. And so I think we need to learn to reframe those times and take the highlighter and highlight the good ones instead and, and learn to look at the, the less than lovely times as opportunities for growth rather than letting the things about our spouse drive us crazy, whether it's their personality differences or, you know, decisions that they make or, you know, even hurtful things maybe that they say to us or, or imply and we read between the lines and we think they're saying to us rather than let them let us make us fall apart or drive us crazy. They need to drive us straight to our knees in prayer and, and to realize, and I don't want to sound like a Sunday school answer pie in the sky thing. I don't mean it to sound that way, but it's, it's just really true that when we learn to look at those bad times and those frustrating times as opportunities for spiritual growth, it changes everything. It changes everything. No longer do we look at our spouses and think, oh, I wish they were different. I wish they were like so-and-so, or I wish they would or wouldn't do this or that. Instead, we can say, okay, Lord, you knew what you were doing when you put me with this man. Right now, I'm severely frustrated, but I know that you're in this somewhere, and there's something you're trying to teach me. There's some way you're trying to grow me to be more like Jesus. Because, you know, we want to be more like Jesus, right? We want to be more patient and loving and filled with grace and forgiveness and, and able to hit the reset button and start over again and not hold grudges against other people. I mean, that's how Christ treats us. We want to be like Jesus. We just don't want to do the hard work of learning to be like him. But if we can learn to see our spouse as that tool that sometimes God uses to kind of rub us the wrong way a little bit, but not to drive us crazy, but to drive us to him. So we go to him and we see spiritual growth when we get opportunities to practice being more like Jesus to this man who sometimes infuriates us. Yeah. And I, I really, um, I love the fact that you say, um, I'm looking for the quote here. You say that those things were being used by God to smooth out your rough edges. And, and I really like that. And you take it a step further, not just reframing the negative, but giving thanks for those things that you can't stand <laughs> sometimes <laughs> and to giving thanks. I mean, I think of Paul and, you know, the thorn, you know, and, and the thorns of life. And sometimes elements of our husband's personalities or things that they do can be like a thorn in our flesh. And you choose to give thanks for those things, not just around them for the, the things that they'll do in your life, but to give thanks for those negative things because it's part of who he is and to acknowledge that it's going to happen again because of this is who my husband is. And yes, there could be growth, but I don't know. I just, I thought that was really, that was kind of a hard teaching. And I just wonder, how did you get to that place? Was that a gradual process to get there? And what would you say to someone who thinks, I don't think I'm there yet. I don't think I can give thanks for the negative. Well, you know, I think of when Paul says to give thanks in all circumstances, he really doesn't say for all circumstances. It's not like we're thankful for those times that are um, difficult in our marriages, but we're thankful in them. In the midst of them, we still thank God for even the simple things. And we thank God for meeting us in the midst of those trying times. And two, I think another thing that really has helped me, um, and I'm not going to say that we got there instantly and, um, or that I got there instantly and just, I'm always just grateful when, <laughs> when something's not going right. It took, it took several years, but one thing that someone said to me once that really opened my eyes was they said, you know, just think of everybody, you know, like your friends, your relatives, your coworkers, the neighbors. Can you really think, is there anyone on the earth that if you were put under the same roof, whether it's marriage or a roommate situation or whatever, I mean, you're going to have issues no matter who the other person is. It's two people together are never going to think the same about everything. They're never going to process life the same. They're never going to be carbon copies of each other. And especially in marriage, my friend Mary one time said to me, you know, if you and Todd thought the same about everything, process life the same, would make the exact same decision in every single situation, then one of you is unnecessary. One of you is unnecessary. Learn to look at those differences and those things that kind of rub you the wrong way as good things and be thankful for them because 
God is trying to get you somewhere and he's using your spouse to get you there. So quit, you know, kind of in your mind thinking, oh, if I was just married to somebody else, or maybe, maybe you don't think that, but you just think, oh, if my husband were just more like so-and-so. No, it doesn't matter what other person in this whole earth you were put together with under one roof, you're not going to get along and agree about every single thing. So if we can quit letting our brains migrate to that place where, oh, it could have been different and realize, no, everybody's got something, right? Everybody's got something and this is my something. So, okay, Lord, what am I supposed to learn? And thank you for the, the growth that's happening in me. Thank you for whatever character quality you're growing in me, whether it's patience or grace or forgiveness or kindness or whatever I'm getting to work on. Thank you. Well, and the funny thing is I sometimes find myself thinking, oh, I wish my husband was more like me in a certain way. But then I, I've fairly recently come to the conclusion that if I had to live with myself, I'd drive myself nuts. I mean, <laughs> if you had a carbon copy of yourself, you'd drive yourself crazy. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. But that's such a good point. And just to rather than complaining, which we'll talk about later, complaining to friends about what, what you don't like, to pray for that for, for, you know, transformation in yourself and, and in your own transformation, seeing transformation in your husband. I, I just think that's such, such wise advice. And, you know, the next part of your book that really stood out to me was very sad and it was the 50%. And it was this story about a couple's Bible study, um, that you were part of and the eventual divorces. Could you share that story? Yeah, a little over a decade ago, my husband and I actually led a small group. We were going through the book Love and Respect before it was actually published by a, a traditional publisher. It was kind of more of a self-published book then, and we were friends with the author, Dr. Emerson Agrich, and we were doing a group in our home that was studying that material. There were eight couples, and again, this is about a decade ago, and today, Four of those couples are divorced and another one's on pretty shaky ground. The only couples still together are my husband and myself, a couple that had been married over 50 years that was in it, and then a couple from my husband's workplace. They didn't even go to our church. It was just a guy he had at work that he was friends with, and he said, hey, would you and your wife like to come study about marriage? But for the rest of them, they're not together anymore. And in a couple cases, um, one in particular, there was biblical grounds for divorce. It was a sad situation. But, you know, in some of them, it was just this feeling of, yeah, I'm not happy, you know, and mm -hmm. God doesn't expect you to be unhappy. I should be happy. This isn't working. I don't know if I ever really loved them. And I think, really? Because like you stood up at the wedding in front of all those people and you said you did. So were you lying? You know, and I'm not trying to be judgmental at all. I honestly have some of those thoughts that run through my mind too. Like I'll look at my husband and think what in me ever thought it was a good idea to marry this man because this is not working and I'm not happy. So if you think the purpose of marriage is to make you happy, you probably are going to naturally deduce that when you're not happy that maybe you made a mistake or maybe you need to get out. But when we can really shift our thinking from marriage being all about us and supposed to just make us giddy all the time to the real purpose of marriage and what God thinks, then I think it can help us to reframe the purpose of marriage and then kind of snap ourselves to attention when our brains start to go to a place where we're thinking, ah, this is not a good idea. I just need to get out. Yes. And, you know, I think some of the marriages that had biblical grounds for divorce, probably that may have happened because of the, those initial feelings of, oh, I'm just not happy, so I deserve X, Y, or Z. And you kind of talk about in the book, you talk about some very clear and sometimes subtle warning signs that you saw along the way in some of these couples or in others in your life. Could you share some of those warning signs that you feel like, maybe I should have paid more attention to these? Well, you know, the biggest one, I think, was and or has been um, that many of the people who sought the divorce or her, some of them who had an affair and then sought a divorce, I like to frame it this or phrase it this way, that they didn't have any spotters in their life. Now, I used to be a cheerleading coach, 
And a spotter is somebody who's on the ground when the rest of the team is making a pyramid or a mount, it's called, and they are there as spotters. So if the person that's on top of someone else's shoulders starts to wobble a little bit, they reach up and grab their ankles and maybe their, their calf if they can reach it and they help to study them before they fall. Well, I think for a lot of people that I've observed in my 30 plus years of being married who have decided to go outside their marriage for uh, having a relationship with someone else, whether it was an emotional affair or actually a physical affair, or just who just decided, eh, I think I'm out of here. This isn't working. They didn't have any spotters in their life. They didn't have anybody who, when they started to kind of wobble, would say something to them. And, and sadly, I know I failed in a few instances to say something to someone. I remember one case in particular where a woman I knew started to pay a little bit too much attention to a man that she saw in a certain social situation a couple times a week. And she started to talk about him and, and um, talk to him, talk to him when she was alone. Then one time they had coffee and then pretty soon they were having an affair and it always made me uncomfortable. I wished I would have said, I wanted to say something to her, but I thought, Oh, I'm probably going to lose her as a friend if I say something. Well, guess what? She's not my friend anymore anyway because she did end up having an affair with that man and left her husband and all of their children and kind of rode off into the sunset with him, which that didn't work out. She's not with him any longer either. But I wish now I had risked saying something, not in a judgmental way, because, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I, any of us could have an affair at any time. But I wish I would have said, hey, you know, something's really making me uncomfortable and I'm not trying to accuse you of anything or whatever. I just feel like I need to say this because I've seen it happen in other instances. I feel like you're paying a lot of attention to so-and-so and mm -hmm. tell me like, are you excited when you see him? I mean, is there these feelings that are stirring in your heart? Because that never goes anywhere good. And when I have done that with someone, it's, it's, I don't know, Jamie, I just really feel like secrecy breeds sin. And when it's secret, and it's exciting and people are sneaking around. It, it's just kind of thrilling. My, my mom used to always say that sin is fun for a while and then it comes back to bite you. And so when they're in this sin is fun for a while stage and it's all secret and it's hush hush and it's sneaking around, it's easier for that person to continue down that road. But when it's brought out to the light, when someone calls it on the carpet and says, hey, this is making me uncomfortable, you know, in a couple instances in my life, the woman has said, you're right, this is wrong. I need to drop off that committee at church or I need to, in one instance, she needed to change jobs. So she was no longer around that person because things had kind of started to get emotionally unhealthy. And so I feel like when we don't have spotters in our life, it, it, we can fall, we can fall. And I, I have a woman whom I will tell immediately if I'm thinking about some guy too much and enjoying his company, because I don't know, he's super talkative and likes to talk politics with me and my husband doesn't, he doesn't really care about politics and he's kind of quiet. You know, I'll just tell my friend, I really liked talking to that guy the other day. I did not do that. And the minute it comes out of my mouth, it's like, it goes away. It's like, Oh, well that was stupid. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go down that road. But when we hide it inside, it can start to, just kind of grow and fester because sin grows in secrecy. And that friend that I say things to, she'll say the same thing to me. We, we just have this agreement that if we ever enjoy the company or the attention of somebody of the opposite sex too much, we'll say something. Now, I've been friends with her 30 years. I've only had to go to her and tell her that once. And she's only had to come and tell me that twice. But I know for both of us, it made it go away because it wasn't being held in secret. I think that is so crucial. I just, I think that's such a, a, a message that we need to hear. And because a lot of these things don't even seem like they're worth bringing up. They seem silly to bring up. And I think you talk about the importance of a crucial confidant, you know, which is this person that you have. And Alana, my podcast partner and I have had a couple of discussions in various podcast episodes. And I think one whole episode just on the importance of confession, both confession directly to God, which obviously there's no one else we need to go to, but the Bible does say confess your sins then to one another. And so we do need to have 
not just prayer partners, but I think confession partners, and it just needs to be one, you know, just someone Mm -hmm. that you can, uh, you know, you don't have to broadcast it to your small group. But I think what you say here is so important and just the details of what that could look like. It could just be, hey, you know, um, I I enjoy, like you said, talking politics to that person. I wish, or even the thought um, that you bring up in the book also is, I wish my husband were more like Mm so-and-so, you know, even if you have that kind of thought, just to say that out loud and say, you know, I know that's a sinful thought and it's, there's so much power in naming something. And like you said, it, to your ears, it probably sounds silly and totally diffuses it of its power and, and just closes the door on that enemy's foothold. And so I just, I really think that that's a really relevant concept to our podcast listeners as a prayer podcast is just the importance of confession to someone else, not only about sinful thoughts that you might have or uh, about another man, but also just in your own marriage, um, someone that's not going to, and, and that goes back to your safety net because it's not just that one person. You talk about a, a net that goes broader than that of several women that, um, you know, that you can confess to or that you can just talk to about your marriage that you know are not going to, um, I guess, egg you on in complaining about your husband, but the kind of women that will set you straight and say, you know, that sounds a lot like tearing him down. You know, are you sure? Is this a prayerful attitude or, you know, someone that's going to be real with you and hold you accountable and, and to have several of these women surrounding you to be that safety net, I think is so important. Yes. And what you say is exactly true. It's not a husband bashing club. And um, actually, you need to pick friends who most of the time will take your husband's side. Um, My group of friends, and especially my accountability partner, Mary, who is my crucial confidant, I always joke that, you know, Todd and I have passed 30 years, but when we pass 50 years married, if we live that long and we are still together, I'm going to send all of them a thank you note because (laughs) they're the ones who, when I go and I process something that happened, they often, because they're a detached objective observer, they will often take his side and say, you know what? I kind of agree with Todd on this one. When you said this, you were out of line, or when you did this, that wasn't very Christ-like. And so they are an objective um, party who can give me advice. And I know that they love me and they have my best interest at heart. I know that they are very prayerful and um, very they have a very high regard for scripture. And so they're always pointing me back to the Bible and they're always pointing me back to Christ. And, you know, is this honoring God? And so even though sometimes things they say to me might sting and might hurt, they're right. And they're, it's what I need to hear. We need not to have friends that'll just give us an, oh, poor baby and let us bash our husbands. And then they'll pile it on and go, yeah, what was he thinking? He's awful. No, we need to have people who will be prayerful and careful and point us back to God. Now, not that they always take my husband's side. Sometimes they'll say, you know, I kind of, I kind of think you're not out of line there. And I'll be praying that you guys can have another conversation about this and you can come, you know, can come to a resolution, but make sure that that person really, really loves Jesus and wants a godly perspective on the situation and will be praying as they process with you. Yeah. And you talk about sister keeping, about being nosy in the right way, which I thought was really neat. Just how we need to look out for one another. And like you said, when we're noticing, um, you shared a story about your neighbor and who noticed that you hadn't been out of the house in a while and, and just asked, is everything okay with you? And how we need to be more like that and, and being nosy in the right way, not so that we'll be the first to be able to report gossip, but so that we can know how to be praying for the, the women in our lives. And, and I really loved that. Um, can you talk about that idea of sister keeping and how it's played out in your life? Yeah, it's kind of what I was talking about a little bit ago about the spotters that we need people who will watch for those times mm-hmm. that we start to wobble. And even before that, I mean, just little check up on people. Like I, what you just mentioned, I had an elderly neighbor that had not seen my car in a while pulling out of the driveway and pulling back in and it had been in the garage for a long time because I was uh, under a deadline for two different writing projects. And I don't think I did leave the house for about six weeks. I just had my 21 year old son running errands for me. And because she didn't see my car going in and out of the driveway, 
it concerned her. There are other people in our neighborhood who you kind of stopped seeing their car and it was because they'd moved out. And I think that was on her mind. And she called me one day and when I answered the phone, we still had a landline at that point and my, she heard my voice. She just said, oh, I'm so glad to hear your voice. Is everything okay? And I said, yeah, everything's fine. What are, you, what are you talking about? I said, I'm under these two deadlines and it's the middle of winter and I've been sending Spencer on all the errands. Um, I've just been kind of cooped up in the house. And she said, well, I just want to make sure everything was okay with you and Todd. And I didn't get offended by it at all. She's not a gossipy, nosy kind of neighbor. She's the sweet elderly woman who genuinely was afraid, like, oh no, not another one, you know? So she thought she better check on me. And I think that we need to be like that, not in a nosy, we want to find out what's going on so we can go plaster it all over social media or <laughs> tell everybody in our circle of friends if something is wrong, but just to kind of check up on people to see how they're doing and, and see what we can be praying for and, and uh, just touch base with them. We so often just leave everybody to fend for themselves while we're, you know, playing around on social media and I'm not against social media. I have it. I, it, it can be a great tool, but so often we're spending all this time touching screens and tapping around to see what everybody else has got going in a kind of a nosy sort of way rather than really spending time touching lives of the people that we know in real life and checking up on them and seeing how they're doing and taking them out for a cup of coffee to see how we can be praying for them. Absolutely. Well, there is so much more that we could talk about that we don't have time for. So Karen, could you let our listeners know how they could find your book um, and, and find you on social media? Sure. My website is KarenEman.com, and Eman is spelled E-H-M-A-N. And the social media accounts are there. Where you can just click on them. And then if they want to know about the book in particular, the marriage book we're talking about, Keep Showing Up, the book actually has its own website, and it's pretty easy to remember. It's just KeepShowingUpBook.com. Okay. And Karen has many other books, what, 12 or 13 other books at least that, um, that will, you probably listeners can find on your website as well. But yeah, this is just, this has been a great time of being able to talk about this really important topic. So thank you, Karen, for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And how can we be praying for you? Well, uh, you and I were talking a little bit before we went on air. I've had a lot of things happen in my life recently some happy things and some not so wonderful. We moved to a new town. Our son got married to a girl from five states away that he met on my Instagram account. That's a whole nother story for another time. And my father, who was 87 years old, fell and was hospitalized and went downhill quite quickly and was transferred from the hospital to ICU to hospice and passed away. And all of those three things, the move, the wedding, and the funeral all happened within five weeks, right at Christmas time. Oh. So, and I had four out of state trips during those five weeks, two for speaking. So I don't even know how I got through those five weeks, except that it was the Lord. But so there's been happy stress, you know, moving in, in a wedding were fun, but then there's been a lot of sadness too. Um, but Thankfully, my father was a believer, and I know that he's not in any pain anymore, so that's good, but it's just all been a lot all at once. So I would appreciate prayers for just getting caught back up in life after, I well, it was about 27 days I, I took off to just be with him and to be at the wedding, and uh, now I'm trying to get that month back. <laughs> it's a little hard. Well, we will definitely do that. So thank you, Karen. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for just helping us to carve out this time to speak about this really important topic of marriage. God, we know that marriages are under attack and that the enemy would love nothing more than to destroy them. God, we just lift up Karen's message and just our listeners listening and um, just Karen and myself. And God, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, convict us of areas in our own marriages where we are falling short or where we have um, misplaced expectations or where we are being sinful or misguided. We just, we lay that all before you and pray that you would fill our hearts and our minds with truth, that you would open our eyes 
to who our real enemy is, and it's not our husbands, and that we would see our husbands in a different light, God, through your eyes. We just pray for the ability to build our marriages up with a firm foundation, that we would expect that there will be difficulty, but that we will expect that you will be working in the midst of it, God, and that your power will transform us and transform our marriages. Lord, I just lift up Karen to you today. I just pray that you would be with her and bless her mind, body, and spirit. I just pray that you would allow her to heal emotionally and just even physically from, from the stress of these last several months of, of just constant activity and just emotional highs and lows. Father, we just pray that you would restore her, God, that you would just redeem that time. And Lord, in Jesus' name, you would just fill her with, with energy, with renewed vision for all of the projects and, and ministry things that she's most likely working on, and that you would just um, plant your spirit in her, God, to just move her forward. Lord, I just pray that you would bring her comfort and peace and joy, and we just thank you so much for the time that we've had to talk with her. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so please leave us a comment to let us know what questions or topics we can address in future shows. Then hop over to prayingchristianwomen.com slash journal to download your free prayer guide. We're so glad you joined us for today's show, and we wish you God's deepest blessings as you draw closer to Him and change the world one prayer at a time.